So welcome to the Capital Link podcast, uh, Shipping. Uh, I'm Nicholas Bornois, president of Capital Link, and I'm delighted that today I have with me two of the best uh, analysts uh, on Wall Street, uh, Ben Nolan uh, with Stifel and uh, Randy Gibbons uh, at uh, Jefferies. Uh, we both work quite closely together, and I'm delighted that they've uh, accepted uh, the invitation to join uh, our discussion today. Our discussion will be on the topic of the crude oil markets, the uh, oil products, and then, you know, their uh, impact on uh, product uh, and uh, crude uh, tanker shipping. So, without any more uh, uh, delay, I will welcome them. Thank you, Thank you Nicholas. Thank yeah. you. And uh, I will start, uh, I'll try to be a good moderator, I don't know, given that they are the experts and I'm not, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Uh, so, the first question I wanted to ask you is, uh, we have seen now crude oil coming back in terms of pricing. Um, the, the price of crude oil is higher. Uh, I think that has created a more positive sentiment uh, overall. Frankly, I personally never understand why when we have cheap oil we're not happy and we have to be happy when we have expensive oil, but that's a different story. Yeah, yeah. Um, but having said that, where, what do we see on the uh, supply side of oil? Uh, we see OPEC having production cuts. Now they're discussing maybe reversing them. We see Venezuela going down the train in a way in terms of production. So what is the picture in terms of crude oil supply? Well, you know, I, I think it, it is a story of sort of two worlds. Um, yeah, as you said, you, you have OPEC and, and even within OPEC, of other member states that, like Venezuela, that are in decline, and it doesn't look as though there's anything that can turn that around. Um, so even in the event that OPEC were to this Thursday increase production or announce a, at some point they intend to increase production, um, in combination with uh, the the Russians and Uzbekistan and, and uh, Azerbaijan and so forth, the other members that aren't in OPEC um, that cut their production. Uh, I, I think it would be challenging to get back to where we were. Uh, the 1.8 million barrels that was cut, uh, in, in our view, the, the best that they could add is probably about 1.3 million barrels. Uh, and that has everything to do, well, in part with, with political problems in places like Venezuela and Libya, but uh, everything to do with the fact that there's just been an underinvestment in oil and gas exploration internationally and, and areas like deep water for the better part of the last five years. And so internationally, um, I think there is some capacity to see some growth in oil production, but it's primarily limited to a little bit in Russia and then a few of the, the places in the Middle East like Saudi Arabia. Again, at best, maybe 1.3 million, which is less than the 1.5 they cut, uh, and more than likely less than that. That's one side of the picture. I think the other side of the picture that uh, from an from an oil macro perspective and a longer term view is even more interesting is uh, the development of U.S. oil and gas. Um, exactly. uh, a year ago at this time the U.S. was exporting about um, uh, one, a little over a million barrels a day. A few weeks ago they did 2.6 million barrels a day. That That is an enormous level of growth in a short period of time and there are some pipeline infrastructure constraints at the moment but I think if you if you go out a few years uh, there, there's no reason that the U.S. couldn't in our view you know potentially be as high as a five million barrel a day export which is absolutely game-changing from an oil perspective so I think OPEC can act, it can help a little bit um, but but they're somewhat limited in ultimately what they can do in terms of a response which is in part why I think you have oil prices rising but ultimately um, the U.S. is uh, growing to become even more influential perhaps than, than is OPEC. Sure. And on OPEC, you know, the production cuts were basically to do two things, bring down global inventories and to rise and increase prices. Both of those have happened. So at what point do they say, all right, we've reached that level of inventories, we've reached that level of prices where we're fine with increasing production again. You have the Saudi Ramco IPO out there, so prices they don't want prices back to $60 Brent or anything lower than that, probably not below $70. Um, and then as Ben mentioned, you know, the production spare capacity is decreasing. Can they even get that 1.8 million barrels a day back? 
immediately? Probably not. In the longer term, sure. Um, on the U.S. side, you know, there are some Permian kind of capacity restrictions in terms of pipeline, and that's why you're seeing a $10 Brent over uh, WTI spread, and even more so for some of the Permian kind of trapped, I guess, uh, crude. Um, obviously, it's $12 or so just to get it to the Gulf Coast. So, and then as he mentioned on the U.S. crude exports, we've seen a VOCC load at the loop. We see that uh, Corpus Christi is dredging out their port to get a VOCC in. So, VOCC, 2 million barrels. So, if they can get that, you know, you can easily see, as Ben was saying, 5 million barrels a day export from the current level of 2.5 or so. Um, so, you, you see a lot of supply, um, kind of uncertainty, but at the same time, U.S. is definitely increasing. Um, Saudi's going to increase at some point, but obviously the Venezuelan, Nigerian, Libyan, other kind of um, production disruptions, how long do they last? It's very interesting with what you say. Uh, you know, we have the OPEC, which traditionally has been sort of a core entity in terms of geopolitics. Sure. Now with the U.S. being such a big uh, crude producer and exporter, I think geopolitically that changed the balance and uh, longer term, I think uh, it may have broader repercussions. I mean, the U.S. now is self-sustained, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of energy. Right. Well, on a net basis, that's relatively true. Obviously, sure. the U.S. is still a huge importer of crude of oil, but that's a, a geographic and product mix um, issue. Uh, uh, but but I agree. I think that the idea that the U.S. is less dependent on foreign oil changes the geopolitical dynamic and who has leverage where. And frankly, I think um, it, is, it is part of the uh, trade and political dialogue to see a, 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 an increase in the exports of hydrocarbons generally. I think that is how uh, the administration, or one of the major tools of the administration, is looking to lever to improve the balance of trade, the balance of payments. And, um, and so I, despite all of the trade war this discussions and, and so forth, I think a year from now, you're going to see more, well, specific, two years from now, certainly, you're going to see more crude oil being exported to places like China. You're going to see a lot more LNG export. You're going to see more uh, uh, LPGs and NGLs. And, and, and so I think uh, it, is, uh, it is absolutely changing the, or, or strengthening the U.S.'s position from a balance of power in the world. Uh, Randy, I think with the price of oil now coming back, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. that might also stimulate the, uh, the exploration offshore and onshore exploration, so that might bring additional capacity uh, of uh, crude oil production. Online, am I right? Absolutely, yeah. And you're, and you're seeing that. You know, Permian's up, um, much further to grow. But again, that pipeline constraints, it, they're there. They're real. You know, it probably won't be until early 2019, maybe in the back half of 2019, until you see that new pipeline expansion pulling it from the Permian down to the U.S. Gulf Coast, where it needs to be. Offshore production still relatively flat over the last, I don't know, five years plus or so. So I think that is definitely a big opportunity for growth um, in the U.S. Gulf, especially. Um, but again, you know, you'll need to see some sustained WTI prices. You know, that's a little more expensive than your kind of Permian basins. And same thing with the um, uh, the Bakken shale, for example. You know, when does that come back to full strength? You know, if WTI stays at sixty five seventy, clearly it's profitable. So all depend on pricing. So we talked about the supply side of crude. Uh, what about the demand side? I mean, right now I think there is uh, sustained growth uh, globally. So everybody uh, seems to be growing at a, a healthy rate. Uh, where do you see the demand coming from for crude oil, and how do we see any new trading patterns and, and trading routes that might affect uh, tanker shipping? Sure. I think on the demand side, you know, no one uses crude. It's pretty much all the refined products. So for demand use of crude oil or demand focus of crude oil, it's where are the refineries expanding. Um, you know, obviously your U.S. Gulf refineries, a lot of refinery expansion in the Middle East, in India, in Asia. Um, so that's kind of where it's, it's mostly being used. And then as well on storage purposes in China. They're taking in as much as they can, building out storage facilities, mostly onshore. Um, so with that, the demand drivers there are refinery throughput, refinery capacity expansion, um, and then obviously your storage facilities. So those are kind of the three main regions that we're seeing demand growth um, kind of grow exponentially. Yeah, and I, I guess to that end, I would say 
I mean, we're going to be just shy of 100 million barrels a day of oil consumption, which is right. one point, yeah, 1.6 million barrels more than last year. So there is certainly some strong level of growth. I would say that it is certainly some of the China and India uh, are, are big contributors to that incremental growth, but uh, also very importantly are some of the developing and emerging economies, um, which at the moment it, around the world virtually every geography is relatively healthy and growing. So uh, I, I would say while we're optimistic on the outlook for, for global oil consumption growth, you, you, there is a degree of sensitivity around uh, the health of emerging markets because those are a big contributor to the incremental level of oil consumption. So right now it looks good, but, but it is something that is worth keeping an eye on. I think a lot of the uh, oil or the crude oil uh, exports from the U.S. go to Latin America and the Caribbean, and but we have also seen a lot more now going to China. Am I right? Is that going to affect tanker shipping positively? Absolutely, yeah. Especially on a ton mile demand basis, you know, coming from uh, the Middle East to China is obviously a much shorter route uh, than the U.S. to China. Even with an expanded Panama Canal, you can't get a Suez Max or a VLCC through there. So you have to go east under you know, South Africa and, and into China. So the ton mile demand expansion is massive, especially coming from the U.S. to China. Right. And I think there's an interesting dynamic there and that part of the reason that it, it is expanding as quickly as it is in terms of a ton mile factor, as Randy said, is that the specific gravity of the oil that's being produced, particularly in the Permian, it tends to be very light and sweet. And, um, you know, the refinery infrastructure within the Atlantic Basin, now that the U.S. has increased its exports as much as it has, is relatively well saturated in, in its ability to consume this light and sweet crude, uh, which is pushing those volumes further and further afield which is uh, is driving the need for infrastructure for things like DLCC loadings at the Loop or in Corpus Christi or in Houston or elsewhere because those longer distances need bigger ships to get the better economies of scale. But ultimately, that is, those longer, more further afield locations are the better buyers because you, the U.S. needs to find uh, a home for the light, light sweet crude that's being produced. In one of the corporate presentations that I was looking at, uh, actually it was the, uh, the Chacos presentation that was the last one to come, uh, they uh, made uh, a mention that I found uh, extremely interesting that uh, if you take uh, India and China, these are two growing economies and collectively they are 2.6 billion of inhabitants out of a global uh, total of 7 billion. Mm -hmm. So you have almost a third of the world belonging in two economies that are growing quite fast, and those economies apparently per, per capita consume a lot less than the rest of, of, of us. So apparently if uh, their per capita consumption goes up even a little, we can see a big uptick uh, in demand. Right, which I think is why you're still seeing um, you know, global oil consumption growing by one and a half to two percent right now, even though Europe is not really seeing a strong level of per capita growth, nor is the United States. The U.S. is a little bit better, but in general, it is those uh, those uh, I don't know that you call China an emerging economy, but but those economies where the per capita some uh, consumption is rising quickly, and there's a lot of people um, to to spread that around to. Yeah. So if we move over now to the product uh, side. Uh, and we look again at the supply and demand, if we look at the supply, what is the driver in terms of, uh, what are the uh, catalysts that we look in terms of supply and demand for the, for the product uh, sector? Sure, I think uh, to start, I think the three biggest things are OECD inventories uh, of refined products. Right now they're finally back below the fiber average after spending two years uh, well above it, uh, maybe more than that. Um, so that's your first catalyst, kind of the end of destocking, switching to kind of using imports to satisfy end user demand, and then restocking is obviously a, a positive tailwind for any of the refined products tankers. Um, secondly, refinery throughput expansion, uh, new refineries coming online in the Middle East, in India, in Asia, um, that is going to definitely increase demand, and especially ton mile demand uh, for the refined products. And then third, I'm sure we'll get to later, IMO 2020, and the further kind of dislocation there of regional production of the very low sulfur uh, fuel oil, marine gas oil, then global consumption of it. So. For all those factors, you're going to, you're going to see a significant, uh, in our view, demand of refined product anchors. And I think 
to add on to that or sort of pair with that a little bit, some of the things that happen when you have destocking of uh, of inventories uh, is that there it, it creates shortages of various products in various places, which doesn't happen when everybody is their tanks full, um, and and that creates pricing differentials that can widen out. Historically speaking, the, the product tanker market was anywhere from 10 to 20 percent arb trade, um, and when inventory levels are high and there aren't pricing differentials in different geographies, uh, there aren't those arb windows. So as we get into a, a lower level of, uh, of inventories, and it, it, it certainly can and probably will open up those arbitrage opportunities that create this extra layer of trading that goes over and above just the underlying consumption of the commodity. And with the rising prices, you'll see more um, trading patterns developed for a U.S. golf cargo diesel going down to Latin America and mid route it might switch to Europe, you know, just because uh, uh, Traffic Era, VTOL, or one of these guys are trading the commodity on board in that rising price environment. So, rising crude, rising gasoline, diesel, jet fuel prices will lead to that kind of further uh, trading patterns. So, we talked about the, the commodity itself, uh, the product side, the, the crude side. Now, let's see how those uh, will impact uh, the shipping end. So on uh, on the crude side, what do you see are the dynamics of the of the fleet supply, uh, the order book, and uh, of course then after that we talk about the product uh, fleet and how the IMO twenty twenty might become a game changer. So let's start with the, the the crude fleet. What is the order book there? What do you see the trends to be? Sure. I'll start yeah, there. you're fine. Uh, so on the crude side, you know the order books down to maybe 12% of the fleet. Basically, year to date, the crude tanker fleet has shrunk. You know, you've seen excessive scrapping, especially February, March, April. Uh, I think there's been more VLCC scrapped in the last six months than I have in the last two years combined, or something like this. Um, so with that scrapping, your, your net fleet is flat to down slightly uh, on the crude tanker side. Um, and with that, there have been an exceptional amount of new building orders. You know, there's some to satisfy you know, IMO 2020, just having larger ships, eco ships, with scrubbers, stuff like this. Um, but outside of that, you've seen you know more scrapping, high steel prices, pretty low, terrible, you know, VLCC rate environment over the last six months, kind of accelerating uh, that scrapping. And then with the order book, you know, down to like I say, maybe 12 percent, we see the fleet growth. 4% or so this year, maybe less next year. Um, you know, there's still a large new building um, uh, capacity that's coming online here in the next six months. And obviously, you've already seen scrapping starting to slow. Probably will continue, uh, but still relatively uh, balanced on a, a supply growth basis. Right. Uh, sorry. Well, I, I was just going to, just so that we're not always saying the same things, I, I think one of the I totally agree that since the first of the year, the crude tanker fleet has, has shrunk uh, marginally. But last year, it grew by a little over 5%. So if you go back to when, at the point at which OPEC initially cut their production, the, even after the first six months of this year, the, the fleet of crude tankers is still 5% more than it was. So if OPEC were to increase its production by, let's say, a million barrels a day, uh, and you add in the fact that the U.S. has also increased its level of production, you're still pretty close to the same level of demand and supply as we were at the point that OPEC cut the production, mm -hmm. which at the end of 2016 the market was okay, but it wasn't fantastic. So I think we, we can't completely say that supply is taken care of. It's not. There, there still are some issues on supply, especially with the order book. We Demand should eventually uh, take care of that, but, but uh, I, I think it is not yet a foregone conclusion that the crude tanker market is out of the woods. Yeah, and for sure, to be clear, yeah, the next six months, um, we are not extremely positive uh, by any means on the crude tanker fleet, you know, or the crude tanker market, especially with the summer kind of seasonal softness, you know, even if Saudi produces more in the next three months, they're going to consume more as well. So exports aren't going to rise dramatically. Supply growth will be there. So we think there will probably be continued weakness in the crude side for the rest of this year at least, but 2019 is looking better. And I guess floating storage is not a factor given the market conditions for right. the cool side. Yeah, yeah. the backwardation no, of oil Nobody prices. wants to store anything anywhere right now. I, I mean, at some point that will turn around if there's a contango in the market or perhaps if the IMO 2020 um, regulations cause there to be a really depressed pricing level for fuel oil, um, you, you could get 
replace some fuel oil storage, but that's not anywhere in the imminent horizon in my in our view at least. So what about the, the product tanker side? How much you said? Um, I, you know, I, I think the case is a little easier on the product tanker side of the story. The, the supply of new ships is what, 8%, so it's substantially less. You haven't seen the same level of scrapping. But the average age of the product tanker fleet is older, so it, it would make sense that you would see some scrapping. And in particular, uh, for uh, for the larger product tankers, the LR2s and LR1s, typically they only trade crude until they're about 15 years. I mean, products until they're about 15 years old. So, so realistically, you you need more like four uh, percent, four or five, even six percent fleet replacement on the larger ships. So, uh, we think supply is a little easier. On, on the product tanker side, and ultimately, as Randy said earlier, uh, this business is, no, nobody's putting crude oil into their cars. Uh, so if global oil consumption is growing by, let's say, 1.6 million barrels a day, and if even only maybe uh, a million barrels a day of that it translate into uh, product tanker cargoes, there's 25 million barrels a day of product tanker volumes right now. So if you add a million barrels on top of 25 million barrels, it's a pretty material increase. And there's the, the potential for ten mile expansion uh, as there's new refineries that are being you know uh, built and and coming online in places like the Middle East or even in the Gulf Coast. And um, so we feel as though there's a, a much healthier backdrop for the product tanker market than there is for the crude market, but the caveat to that is uh, it's taken an awful long time um, and, and that thesis has been in place for a little while and hasn't exactly. entirely played out yet. So uh, it, we're, it's been an awfully frustrating trade for us and, and I know for a lot of investors as well. Yeah, same thing. You know, we expected the cycle turn a little sooner. We're already in mid-June and rates are okay, you know, but they've yet to really uh, materialize on the MR side, LR side of strengthening. Um, but with that, there hasn't been an excessive amount of ordering. Order books are pretty much at capacity or not going to be more. Any order today won't be delivered by first quarter of 2020. So you kind of have a uh, extreme visibility in the order book through at least the end of 2019. Uh, we see supply of maybe 2.5% both this year and next. Um, as Ben alluded to, 1 million barrels a day on a 25 million barrel a day market, 4% demand growth. So you're going to see a outpacing of demand over supply, but it, it really is going to come down to the inventory levels. They're still destocking. They're below the five-year average, still going a little lower. At what point do they say, okay, we're, we're done destocking, we're going to start importing more and maybe yeah. even restocking. So that's the uh, $64,000 question. And I think what remains to be seen is whether or not you can longer term have a decoupling of the product tanker market from the crude market. So if, uh, is it, we've never really seen it before where say that an MR earns 30000 a day and a VLCC only earns fifteen. That's never really happened. Um, we, this might be a new paradigm, but you always have to be careful when you're talking about a new paradigm. So that there probably is going to be some correlation between the two. Uh, businesses going forward, like it or not. Mm -hmm. Now that brings me to the next question: the you know the IMO 2020, how much of a catalyst and game changer it is for the industry. And uh, <clears throat> one of the questions that uh, Randy and I were discussing before is the availability of uh, low sulfur uh, uh, mm -hmm. fuel. When that happens, I guess that will also um, have an impact uh, on know, on uh, product tanker demand, uh, because on one hand you need to have the uh, transportation mm -hmm. to yeah. the distribution points, on the other hand you will be using more of it. Right. Uh, so how big is 2020, everybody's talking about that, and what do you think will be the uh, impact on the industry? Yeah. Yeah, I think on the product tanker side it's going to be um, a kind of a double-edged sword. You know, one, you're going to have more movements of the end, you know, 0.5% content bunker fuel that needs to be consumed globally but produced kind of regionally. And two, for blending purposes, you're going to have to take diesel uh, and marine gas oil and blend it with kind of the high sulfur fuel oil in other parts. So you're going to have to take the 0.1% sulfur content to other, you know, regions, blend that, and then transport that new bunker fuel, the new 0.5% kind of very low sulfur fuel oil, what have you, blended fuels, marine gas oils, to the end user. So on the products tanker side, you know, there's going to be a, a massive multiplication of ton mile demand. The, the 
million barrels per day movements might not change extensively, but there's going to be further triangulation, um, new routes developing, all of these things, and then the same on the crude side, and I'm sure Ben can add more to it, but the, you know, the, the refinery slate mixes and the crude productions, light sweet versus heavy sour, and where it's going, where it can be refined, um, we think there's going to be a lot of dislocation. I think that's right. Uh, I, I think in, in traditionally in shipping and in any logistics business, when there is dislocation and disruption, it tends to favor the traders and the logistics provider, which is what we're doing here. So, um, so I, I think that's helpful, and it, it remains to be seen exactly how big of an opportunity it is for the product tanker market. I think it, global. Marine fuel consumption is anywhere from four to five million barrels a day, depending on who you listen to. If even half of that were to sort of rotate towards the, the product tanker market, it, it's an enormous uplift. Again, on 25 million barrels a day, that's, uh, that's a 10% or 8% increase in, uh, in potential production. Whether or not that really happens, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, it, it will... Uh, the cost of transportation will factor into that. Um, the availability of other fuels, the uptake of scrubbers, a exactly what gets moved where. I think there's still a lot of moving parts. It's hard to imagine that this won't be beneficial for the product tanker market, especially to a lesser extent the crude tanker market. Uh, but uh, but quantifying the ultimate impact uh, is 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 still a little early yet. I think. Yeah, and that's all just on the demand side. You know, when you get to the supply side, how does that affect, how does the IMO 2020 regulations impact supply? Two reasons, you know, there are two things. One, you're going to slow down your fleets, so instead of burning, I don't know, 30 tons of bunker fuel going 12 knots, you might go to 27 tons of bunker fuel by going 11 knots. So if you go from 12 knots to 11 knots, that's 8% of the fleet kind of taken out there. Um, and more so, we think scrapping uh, will accelerate significantly, especially if you're a 15, 16, 17, 18 year old crude or refined products tanker um, that's very fuel inefficient, you're going to scrap those vessels. I'll take the other side of that trade. People don't scrap vessels when they make money on it, ever. Okay, that is true. So, going back to what we just discussed, once we have the, uh, you know, the, the low sulfur uh, fuel available, that will have uh, clearly an impact on ton mile demand and uh, on you know, the demand for that particular fuel. Until then, and I think a number of people are expecting that to start happening at the end of 19, possibly 2020. Also, I read that uh, a couple of the major refiners come out saying that they will have plenty, hopefully, uh, of that the fuel available. Yeah. But until it happens, then your points are well taken that we might see more scrapping. Uh, we might see uh, a number of people not willing to make the capital investment for the older ships. Uh, and that should have a positive effect on uh, fleet supply. Sure. But I, you know, I, I have listened to a number of debates among the various uh, CEOs, and it seems that no one is really sure about what is going to happen. I mean, you have people who are going to invest in scrubbers, not invest in scrubbers, wait and see. So there doesn't seem to be um, uh, any consensus as to one or two alternatives that most people will follow. Yeah, I, I would say that's true, except that the, there's no question that preponderance of people are going to be using just lower sulfur fuel. Um, so there, there's really no choice to that. Um, there's not enough scrubber capacity or LNG re-engineering capacity or whatever. So that is going to be what has to happen. Uh, the question is, on the margin, who has the option to even sort of investigate alternative um, means of, of fuel or sources of fuel. And, um, I, I would say that the even in the last several months, the, uh, the acceleration of acceptance of the scrubber idea has been dramatic. Uh, I think that we were, were something like uh, 350 uh, vessels with scrubbers or scrubber orders at the end of the year. There's already been 700 scrubbers ordered in the first six months of this year. Uh, and and it, it's growing every month. So th that is going to be a very material aspect of the business. And I would say, in general, people with the capital to afford it and ships where it is well-suited are coming around to the scrub ready very quickly. 
Actually, I listened to uh, a Product Tanker CEO panel today, and uh, they were just mentioning that uh, if you ordered scrubbers uh, a year ago, the turnaround time by the manufacturer was about a year. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go, the turnaround time is 18 months to 24 months. So it's exactly your point. There seems to be a lot more demand for the installation of scrubbers, uh, but it is a capital investment. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, if in the meantime the low sulfur uh, fuel becomes available, that investment may not ultimately, yeah. I mean, it will pay off, but. Yeah, and the scrubber debate is massive, you know, yeah. I think uh, for the pricing and for the availability, I think as you see more orders for scrubbers, you'll see new suppliers. You know, there's some suppliers taking order for scrubbers that have never even made a scrubber. They're like, we'll make you one. Let's go figure out how. Uh, so you, you'll see that kind of proliferation going, and that will probably reduce the price of scrubbers. And you know, we've heard ballpark estimates of two million to five million dollars, seven million dollars, depending on the size of the scrubber and the vessel and the engine. And then for scrubber availability um, or, or demand for scrubbers, sorry, um, fuel availability is an issue. Uh, further regulation right now, there's an open loop and a closed loop system. The open loop kind of dumps the sulfur into the ocean, you know, how uh, sustainable or environmentally friendly is that really? Um, so there might be further regulations against that. Um, and then with the scrubbers, you kind of, the pros are you, you know that, you know, it, it works and you can use the same fuel with these new blended fuels can engines use those, you know, what's the viscosity? How is that going to affect the lubrication of the engine? So there, you're right, there is no consensus. Um, we see half the owners are saying we are all about the scrubbers and we're going to make a lot more money. The other half are saying scrubbers are pointless and we're not going to touch them. Yeah. I also listened uh, to an argument that it seems a number of charters now are requesting for ships with scrubbers and they're trying actually to uh, put the capital investment on the owner and accelerate the process, mm -hmm. which I found very interesting. Sure. That if that happens, obviously, it's a big, you know, plus for the installation of scrubbers. Sure. Well, if, if, it, if the charter will pay for it, the mandate, and I know yeah. Cargill has said that they're not going to do any uh, long-term charters without vessel on dry bulk vessels unless they have scrubbers. Uh, you know, BP did some long-term contracts with Marin at rates that were ten thousand dollars a day better than current market rates. So uh, I, I think that what you're seeing is both the charter and the ship owner currently being able to benefit. Uh, so the economics are being shared. Uh, initially that was one of the concerns I know of a lot of the owners, were we going to make this capital investment and not be able to get our money out? And what we're beginning to see is that there is a premium being placed by the charters on the option at least to uh, to have a lower cost fuel and they're willing to pay for it, which is driving the acceleration of acceptance of the idea. And just to give the scrubber thing some context real quick, so as Ben said, maybe 700 or so vessels with scrubbers on order, maybe that gets to 2,000 by January 2020. That's on a fleet of 40,000 vessels. So at most, 5%, 7% of vessels will have scrubbers come January 2020. So the vast majority will have to use 0.5% fuel, 0.5% sulfur fuel. Well, at the Capital in Conference in Posidonia, I think there were some very passionate uh, remarks uh, about, sure. uh, you know, the environmental regulations. Uh, Mr. Prokopiu mm -hmm. was a very uh, eloquent proponent of uh, what the industry should be doing, and I think uh, one of the uh, one of the arguments that he made was that uh, slow steaming can actually be one of the ways to uh, alleviate the problems, and those who don't want to slow steam and want to continue going at uh, regular speed, mm -hmm. then they can pay for the additional pollution that they create. I mean, there are many ways to skin the cat, but I, I thought it was particularly interesting to hear those captains of the industry um, essentially saying, you know, we, we have to comply with the regulations, but at the same time, you should be giving us the fuel to burn, and we will burn it, rather than make us mobile refineries while we navigate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I think if I were if I were a ship owner uh, with billions of dollars in the bank and billions of dollars worth of assets, uh, I would be doing everything I could to discourage people from using scrubbers because for that very reason, the the less scrubber development there is, 
the more likely a slow steaming event takes place. And if slow steaming takes place and you artificially reduce the size of the fleet by whatever, eight or 10 percent, it raises the ceiling on what people can pay um, for those charter rates. But uh, while I would be telling the rest of the world to not order scrubbers, I would be on the phone with Wardzilla seeing how much it would cost to get my fleet outfitted for that reason because I will have a, if it plays out, I'd have a dramatic competitive advantage uh, relative to everybody else. And so I think that's exactly what's happening. There's, there's a lot of people saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But there are weaker hands who appreciate the option of this very in, enticing economic incentive. And I think the, the other important thing, again, if I was a ship owner, I, I would be discouraging um, uh, scrubber adaptation because one of the things that worries me is people ordering vessels for the wrong reasons. Um, if you go out and say, hey, well, if BP is going to pay me $35,000 a day for a VLCC and I can order one at whatever 80 and get a nice five-year contract, well, that's great. I can go do it. The problem is that today VLCC rates are six, $8,000 a day. There's plenty of ships in the fleet that can meet that demand. If you go out and oversaturate the market with new vessel orders that were done on the basis of techno technological changes, you're going to saturate the market and cause everything to fall. And so, yeah, you might have the best ship, but you have the best house in a bad neighborhood. Uh, and we've seen that happen before, and, and I think it is a, it's, a, it's a real risk. Yeah, IMO or not IMO, capacity discipline is going to be and has always been and has always, and will always be the driver of outbreaks. Absolutely, and I think it's uh, closing our discussion. It's fascinating that this is a, a very big question, the, the IMO 2020, and it's very interesting to see the plurality and diversity of opinions and uh, policies uh, that the owners are going to implement. Uh, and I guess at the end of the day, we'll see how things evolve. Um, but it is a very competitive industry, and you're right, everybody is trying to find the best way uh, to address the issue uh, and be compliant uh, and safe. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I, I honestly, I think this is the best thing that has happened to the shipping industry in a really long time for several reasons. First of all, it's great that uh, hopefully we're, we're reducing emissions um, as an industry, but, but secondly, um, there is almost no way that this isn't going to be disruptive. We were talking about earlier, whether it's moving around products or slow steaming or something else, you're, you're artificially either reducing supply or um, creating incremental demand. That's great for the business. It's great for tankers and dry bulk and uh, containers and everything. So this is a, a nice bit of... Uh, uh, legislation that while the ship owners I think initially were pretty um, wary of, uh, ultimately I think this is going to benefit everyone quite a lot. Yeah, and I think it puts a lot of optimism in an already optimistic uh, industry. <laughs> yeah. I think people are like, ooh, 2020, it could be great. Uh, so it's going to come down to enforcement too. You know, it's a topic we didn't really touch on much and, and nobody knows, is it the port state, the flag state, um, how are they going to enforce this? Um, but. If the enforcement is there, IMO is pretty much committed to a January 1st, 2020 implementation date. Um, it could be a game changer. So last question uh, before we close. Uh, what about, uh, you know, with, what's the correlation between the price of oil and LNG with oil be, being now higher? How do we see the LNG market coming into play? Sure. I'll go and you can uh, So yeah, historically it's a 12 to 14 percent link uh, with Brent. So if Brent's $100, it's about 12 to 14 dollars per MMBTU of LNG. Uh, Brent's 50, it goes to six dollars, right? Uh, so currently you're around 75 dollar Brent. LNG prices are above 10 dollars, actually about 11. Uh, we'll call it in Asia, maybe nine and a half, ten in Europe, and eight and a half, nine or so in Latin America. Uh, but yeah, that, that's pretty massive because right now you're Basically, delivered cost is around seven fifty, especially for these U.S. liquefaction facilities. Three dollars for the Henry Hub, three dollars for the liquefaction, a dollar to ship it, fifty cents to regas it. So, as long as your LNG prices are above that, you'll see you'll see incremental spot cargos, and that's what you're seeing. That's why right now LNG prices at eleven dollars are at a four-year high for June. LNG rates 
at 60,000, I don't know, 55, 60,000 a day uh, in June or at a four year high uh, for this time of the year as well. So in, in a historical kind of softer period uh, of June, you're already seeing rate strengthening. A lot of that is on the back of stronger LNG prices. So a crude environment that is positive and growing will positively impact the LNG shipping market. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do. I would say that I think we're seeing a decoupling of, uh, of LNG from oil. Sure. Uh, as there is more, as there is more LNG in the world, and there's more spot LNG that's available, and there's better markers. So, so now Platts quotes the the Japan Korea marker, so JKM, and and there is a way to sort of get visibility into what the the real Asian price is that doesn't have anything necessarily to do with crude. Uh, I I think the the two commodities will begin to trade on their own merits more and more. Well, thank you very much. We had a very interesting discussion. I think uh, it lasted uh, almost 40 minutes. I, I appreciate very much your being with us today. Thank so you. So this is the Capital Link uh, webinar series. Um, we try to uh, have always interesting discussions with very interesting people. Uh, so thank you again, and uh, I look forward to having another round of discussion, another debate in the near future. Thank you, Nicholas, and thank you for all that you do for the industry. Yeah. Well, to you too, guys. It's great. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much.